All right, here's part four of Underwater Wild, and it is called Full Fathom Five. My mood shifted and I became edgy. At first I thought that it must have been post-traumatic stress connected to my incident in the cave and that it would soon pass. However, weeks went by and I only felt worse. I also started to ha have disturbing dreams and often saw my house, Table Mountain, and even the city swallowed by enormous imploding sinkholes. I took this as a potent warning sign from my unconscious, but I had no way of knowing what I had woken up. I fell into a deep depression and at times felt so disassociated that it seemed like I was floating above my body. Watching myself was like watching a total stranger and I listened from far away as this person I used to be spoke on autopilot. I also found being with Joseph draining. I just didn't have the energy to enter his world so I retreated further into mine. When a friend invited me to join him on a sailing trip through the South Pacific, I jumped at the offer. Traveling with him and two other friends through the beautiful society in Tuamotu Islands and surfing incredible tropical waves would be a welcome distraction. However, when we got to Tahiti after a month of sailing, I heard that a good friend had committed suicide. He had seemed happy enough, had a lovely wife and a beautiful young son, and supposedly every reason to live. I returned to Cape Town, but every cell in my body wanted to continue sailing the Pacific and then into the Indian Ocean. I didn't want to return home to the stress of being a parent and the darkness that I felt was waiting for me. When I arrived at the airport, my wife and son looked so happy to see me and I did my best to hide my feelings of alienation as I greeted them. I continued to see Craig when I got back home, but I had lost my passion and he noticed how distant I had become. I often forgot my mask or flippers and made other excuses why I couldn't dive. I also couldn't take the cold, even for 20 minutes, and would get out almost as soon as I got in. Diving in the kelp forest without a wetsuit seemed stupid now, and I wondered why I had ever been interested in it. Compared to tropical diving in the Pacific, this felt like self-flagellation. Craig had moved on from his beloved cuttlefish and his new focus was the rock sucker, which I recognized as the same little pug of a fish he had he had caught at the start of our first dive. He was now fully dedicated to learning everything a person could possibly know about these animals and had even installed an expensive aquarium in his house to study them. He showed me how they clung to the rocks and worked their way high out of the water, surfing waves up the rock face. When they were in position, they would quiver for a few seconds before locking their jaw onto a limpet. In a quick twisting motion, they would take the limpet off of the rock like we twist the top off a bottle. Craig had discovered this motion using high-speed camera equipment and was incredibly excited about his find. Professor Charles Griffiths is a much-loved and respected marine biologist who spent four decades as a researcher and teacher at the University of Cape Town. He's a kind, sparky man of 60-something years whose knowledge of the ocean around South Africa is both broad and deep. He discovered more than 100 new species during a 40-year career and co-authored Two Oceans, the reference bible for all things marine in Southern, in Southern Africa. Craig had been in contact with Charles for some time, helping him to find and photograph where rare animals and plants in the forest and joining him on intertidal walks at spring low tides. This was a wonderful chance for him to learn from the Grand Master, and they soon became great friends. When Craig shared his images of the rock sucker with the pro professor, he was amazed to learn that the behavior was new to science. Working with marine researchers at the university made Craig as excited as a child, and when he discovered a new species of shrimp, microscopic and translucent to the point of being nearly invisible, he was overjoyed. After the discovery was confirmed, the shrimp was named in his honor, Hederomyces fosteri. He and Charles went on to discover three more shrimp species together. I was proud of him, but I just couldn't share his interest. I was sure he was aware of my lack of enthusiasm. Nature seemed to be a cruel process of eat or be eaten, and I thought about those limpets with their sweet faces being devoured by a monster fish that could breathe air and climb rock faces. It all seemed to be pointless, but not without any play but now without any playfulness.
Oh, that's a really pretty picture. Just scroll through the photos. Toward the end of that summer, after a swim near Simon's Town, I was walking back to my car when I noticed a sailboat far out at sea. Craig walked on, but I stayed to watch it for a while. There was something hypnotic about the little white sail passing over the horizon, and I sat down on the grass to contemplate it. Soon it passed out of sight, and all I could make out were countless white horses ruffling the blue sea. It was a lonely sight, and normally I would have gotten up and watched the feeling off, but for some reason the sight of that sail drifting away held me. As I sat there, I thought of my father and wondered what had become of him. There was a moment of stillness, then a giant crack opened in my mind and it hit. A massive, pent-up wave of grief came crashing down on me. In the days that followed, I was overcome by a compulsion to find out what had happened to my father. I needed action, something to do that would help take the horrible feelings away. Was he even alive? Did he have another family? Where had he ended up? I was expecting a long and probably fruitless search, but when I typed his name onto Facebook, he immediately appeared. I was blown away. Was it gonna be that easy? I went to his photo album and saw hundreds of pictures of Finbo's flowers in the mountains. Was this the tough as nails father I remembered? Something about the mountains seemed very familiar, and I searched further until I found a wider landscape shop. To my amazement, I saw in the distance a familiar lighthouse and a gorgeous wind-blown sea and a ring of purple mountains in the distance. I was looking at Falls Bay. I knew that my father probably lived on the Cape Peninsula and that I must have driven past his house hundreds of times over the years. He could have lived anywhere in the world, and yet here he was, so very close. I took a deep breath and sent a brief message saying that I was his son and that I wanted to meet him and introduce him to his grandson. I concluded by saying that I came in peace and that I didn't need anything. Two days later, I received a friendly note saying that he was happy to meet me along with his address in, of all places, Simon's Town. I was thrilled. I told Joseph, who was six, that he had a grandfather whom he had never heard of before. He was curious and agreed to meet him. I was also amazed to notice that most of the pictures in my house were of sailing boats, as if I had unconsciously picked these images to remind me to wake up one day. In front of my bed, I even had a huge painting of a lone sailing boat trimming through a moonlit sea in a faraway ocean. Once I realized what it meant for me, it was so obvious a symbol as to be almost embarrassing. When we arrived at my father's house, my, fa my first impression was of a tidy, humble suburban home near the main road. The view from his front lawn was bizarre. Looking over the yacht club and marina of my childhood, I shook my head in disbelief. Eventually, I rang the doorbell and stood with a pounding heart while I waited for the door to open. I held Joseph's hand tightly for support, but noticed that he seemed totally unconcerned. I knew that I would see a different man from the one I remembered, but still, there he was, nearly 70 years old. He was stocky and looked healthy enough, but so much smaller than I recalled. He still had piercing blue eyes, though, the color of the Arctic Sea. He was visibly nervous, which I found oddly reassuring, as I remembered him to be so confident. We bustled through the greeting, and I was grateful to have Joseph to introduce and talk about. He showed me around his garden and proudly told me how he had planted all the trees and how he had recently made the palisade fence all on his own. He explained in detail how he had dug the holes and poured the concrete, bought the fencing direct from the supplier and erected it himself to save money. To my surprise, I could see that he was trying to show me that he was a self-made man and I understood that he was worried about my opinion of him. This was confusing because I had always thought that he couldn't care less what I thought about him. He actually seemed scared of me. It didn't add up. I had the same impression when he showed me around his home, which was spotlessly clean. I noticed a photograph of my sister and myself, probably in our early teens, sitting together on a plastic chair by a pool. I had no idea how we got the photo, but stranger still was that he had hung it on his wall. Beginning to see that my father was not the man I thought he was, I felt as if my magnetic north was moving. We soon ran out of polite conversation, so we went down to the beach below his house. As we walked, I tried to give him an account of my life, and he did the same. His story was one of abandonment, war, and adventure. After he had left us, he sailed to America, where he lived until his foster mother died in Cape Town. He returned home and, after years of farming in the Boland District, retired to live in Simonstown. 
I told him about my wife, my education and career, and my years as a father. He listened carefully, and as the minutes passed, the relief started to flood into me. I found my father, and it was as if a missing part of my body was magically growing back. Despite all my fears, Joseph had grown into a healthy, beautiful child. He had lively eyes and a deep curiosity. Me and my father immediately had a great connection, spontaneously holding hands as we walked back to his house. When we got there, I noticed a stunning wooden kayak in the garage. I had never seen such a beautiful boat and marveled at the lines and the craftsmanship. When I asked my father where he had got it, he modestly told me that he had made it, as if it was the kind of thing anyone could do. I was proud of him and told him that, that I had never made anything with my hands. He encouraged me to try and make one and I agreed, believing that it could be a good project to start building a relationship on. Over the next few weeks, we got the materials from specialist wood and building supply stores. They were simple enough, and so, with a Japanese saw, a staple gun, a bottle of glue, and hundreds of strips of western red cedar, I started building the boat. My father loaned me a few of his tools, helped me, helped me prepare, prepare the framework, and taught me how to shape, align, and join the strips together. It was a very satisfying process, one that I enjoyed from the beginning. I was amazed at how natural it felt to work alongside my father in my garage, as if we had been doing it our whole lives. It was a dance that we both instinctively knew the steps to. Joseph also tried to help, and it was sweet to watch him sand away at the hole until he was covered in sawdust. At the end of a long day of boat building, my dad mentioned that he was impressed with my touch. I was so happy I had to look away. Afterward, I realized in a bittersweet moment that it was the first compliment I had ever received from him. Once he had shown me the basics, I continued on my own and slowly the hole started to take shape. I would visit him a few times a week and we spent hours walking through the mountains and catching up on lost years. I was careful not to confront him about our time as a family though, and so we spoke about his childhood in the Northern Cape, his years as a soldier in what was then Rhodesia, and his sailing days in life in America. He was frank and open in these talks, telling me interesting stories of his adventures. He said that he was abandoned by his mother when he was a baby and grew up with a cold and distant foster, and fa foster family on a farm in the old Transvaal of South Africa. Although they cared for his material needs, he admitted that they never gave him the love that he craved. He saw how his foster, foster brothers and sisters received this attention and felt the pain of jealousy. He mentioned how he would ex escape to nature and that he learned to ride a horse as a very young child. He would collect snakes from the bush in a big plastic bag. Once, a venomous snake bit through the bag and onto his bare back, and he got very sick and nearly died. Sooner or later, I knew that I had to talk to my father about what had happened on the sailboat and how he had left without saying goodbye. I was dreading this talk because I knew everything could so easily fall apart. I eventually found the courage to bring it up late one afternoon as I was preparing to leave his house. Standing by the car, I simply told him that it had really hurt when he left us, and that only recently had I seen the true scale of the hurt. I told him that I hadn't realized how I had carried the pain of losing him my whole life, and that I found that I loved him despite everything that had happened. I was very careful to confront him without any blame, but still, as I was saying all this, he began to physically crumple. His shoulders tensed, he folded his arms, and he dropped his head to stare at the ground. He didn't make a sound, but I thought he was crying, although I couldn't see his eyes to know for sure. When I realized that he couldn't respond, I mumbled a goodbye and left. This moment of raw honesty was a turning point for me. Although he couldn't speak of it, it was plain that my dad was fighting back a troubled ocean of his own pain. I could clearly see that being abandoned so early in his life had hurt him beyond his own comprehension, and I understood now for the first time why he was unable to be a father. The danger of being abandoned again by his family was simply too awful for him, so he had to leave. He didn't need to say any of this. I understood it anyway, and I felt desperately sorry for him. I realized that we both lived in fear of abandonment. If we could cross the snowman's land and learn to trust each other, we could begin to heal ourselves. There was hope. Opening up to my father also seemed to help me open up to the sea forest again, and I would join Craig more often. He was trying to push deeper into what he called the forest mind, and I knew what he, that he needed a method. Using a technique that he had learned in the Kalahari, he started to make a mental, mental maps of his favorite diving spots, starting with an area the size of a tennis court. Over many months, he memorized the seabed and every one of its underwater structures. This is how he learned where every creature and plant preferred to live, and also where the glitches lay. 
These glitches were to prove were to prove to be the key to unlocking doorways between dimensions. The first glitch that Craig noticed was in the form of a round orange sponge the size of a tennis ball. After weeks of swimming past it, he saw that it had moved. The movement wasn't dramatic, but the sponge had definitely moved. Sponges don't move. They grow on rocks and are inert, so this was unquestionably a glitch. Puzzled, Craig started to take more notice of the sponge, fixing its location in his mind map. When he returned, he saw that it had shifted its position again. Now he knew for certain that something strange was going on. The forest was winking at him, and he couldn't resist the call. He swam down and picked up the ball. When he turned it over, he found a curious crab staring out of it. He learned that the slow-moving little monster, a cloaked sponge crab, cuts off pieces of poisonous ascidian, also known as sea squirts, and grows them over its body as a protective cloak. Without this cloak, the vulnerable crab, vulnerable crab would never survive. At first, I found it difficult to tell the difference between the sponges that clung to the rock and the crab, but after some practice, I could easily spot the cryptic animal. Aww, it's cute, but also a little scary. About six weeks had passed since I had found my father, during which time I had seen him a dozen times. The hull of the kayak was almost finished, and I was very proud of the work I had put into it. It still needed to be glassed, and then I would begin on the deck, finally joining the top and bottom of the boat before cutting out the cockpit and adding the rudder. This type of kayak, called a petrel, after the beautiful pelagic seabird, was designed for open ocean paddling and I was looking forward to taking it into the kelp forests and farther out to sea. I was still a few months away from finishing the boat and there was a lot of work ahead, but I was feeling relieved that I had passed the danger point with my father. In my mind, we would build the boat together and the effort and its successful conclusion would be the foundation for a lasting relationship. We had survived many meetings and he seemed as relieved about this as I was. I encouraged my sister to reach out to him as well, assuring her that old age had softened him. I described him as a changed man. Healing was possible, I promised, and I hoped that she would have the courage to follow me and mend the past. She was very weary at first, but she called him eventually and they planned a time to meet. My father was always closer to my sister than to me, so their meeting was far more emotional than ours. They both cried openly the moment they met, and it seemed that a dam of repressed emotion had burst at long last. I was happy for both of them, and felt rather proud of myself for having helped my sister to face her fears as well. During this time, my mother was also going through an upheaval. She was separating from her husband and needed to move. When she asked for my help to buy a cottage in Simon's Town, I agreed without thinking through the consequences. When I mentioned this to my dad, he seemed taken aback, but he quickly but when he quickly recovered, I thought nothing more of it. Their houses were at opposite ends of Simon's Town, and they had not seen each other for more than 30 years. She had no interest in seeing him, and he had no intention of meeting up with her, so I assumed that there was nothing to worry about. So when my father began to cancel visits for no good reason, and with a perplexing casualness, I was stumped. When I made an unannounced visit to his house, he was slightly hostile. I suggested we go for a walk and swim at the nearby beach, and although he didn't seem to want to, he agreed. As we were walking along the shoreline, a child kicked a football in our direction by mistake. It hit my father on the shoulder, and although it wasn't a hard blow, he verbally attacked the child in a disturbing way. I thought to myself that he was probably just in a bad mood and laughed it off, but there was a lingering feeling that something wasn't right. A few days later, he sent me an email entitled, One Tough Marine. It was a chain mail about a young Corporal Todd who had lost both legs and an arm in a bomb blast in Afghanistan. It showed pictures of the mutilated man skydiving, wrestling alligators, and crawling over barbed wire, all without his legs and arm. The final picture showed him dragging his torso through a river of mud, and the caption read, Your excuse is invalid. It was a motivational piece, probably to inspire people to try harder, but I couldn't help concluding that the message should have been <laughs> avoid war at all costs or try not to stand on a landmine. I didn't respond, but the uncomfortable feeling was growing. Why would he send this to me? 
When my father stopped answering my calls and emails, I realized that something fundamental had shifted. I hoped he would soon connect again, but as days stretched into weeks, my anxiety grew. I left many messages for him and eventually asked him directly what the matter was. At last, he replied and I received a short, nasty message saying that he knew he could never trust me. By helping my mother move to Simonstown, I had betrayed him as he had always known I would. He told me that I could keep his tools and build my own boat. He told me he never wanted to see me again. He also sent my sister a text message saying he didn't want to see her again either. Both my sister and I were smashed by this unexpected rejection, but while she took the route of, I always knew he would do this, I tried to find a way back. I wrote a long email seeking an explanation and a resolution, but he didn't respond. Completely crushed, I went tumbling headlong back into the abyss I had known as an eight-year-old. Once again, I had lost my father, but I knew that this time there was no hope of making things any better. I felt shamed and abandoned, and my fall was steep and hard. I had an unfinished boat in my garage and no desire to do another moment's work on it. I tried to find the motivation to throw it out, or maybe sentimentally torch it on some lo lonely beach, but I didn't even have the energy for that. Craig was very supportive and pleaded with me to join him as often as possible in the sea forest. He said it would help me to heal and that I should stay open to the cold. He also said that he had something special to show me and had been meaning to do so for a while, but now he felt that it was the right time. He pushed me to join him on a long kayak trip, and even though it was the last thing I felt like doing, I agreed to go. A week or so later, with the, when the conditions were calm enough, we paddled for hours until we finally reached a small cave at the base of a high cliff. The cave was only accessible by sea, so I was certain hardly anyone had ever been there. Even though the swell was small, landing on the shore was tricky because of the currents. We made it safely though, stored Craig's plastic kayaks on the slippery boulders and walked carefully up to the mouth. When I entered, I noticed the change in air pressure and that the damp air was pungent with the smell of guano and the, remaining, and the remains of a rotting seabird. I stood still for a moment, waiting for my eyes to adjust to the low light and, when I looked, and then looked around. On the floor of the cave, I saw a scattering of large bones. When I noticed a human skull lying in the open, I realized what Craig had brought me here to see. This was the first human skeleton I'd ever seen, and as I stood there listening to the hollow drumming of waves on the stones, I wondered who this person had been and why they'd ended their life along, alone in this cold, empty cave. Craig pointed out a scattering of shells and animal bones that lay all over the cave, and explained that they were evidence of the person's last meals. I found the place oppressive and went out to get fresh air. Soon, Craig joined me and started to make a cup of tea. Sitting on the rocks and staring out across the ocean, we talked about the skeleton. He told me that when he had first found it a few months ago, he had thought it was a drowned fisherman. However, when he looked closely at the teeth, every hair, that stood up, every hair had stood up on the back of his neck. They were worn flat in the classic way that affects all hunter-gatherers. There was not a single cavity in any tooth, attesting to a wild diet without sugar. He realized then that he was looking into the eye sockets of one of the very last fully wild humans who had lived in an unbroken lineage for more than 150,000 years along our coastline. He explained that many scientists believe that our species was actually born on this stretch of coastline and then migrated out of Africa, eventually colonizing the entire planet and reaching Hawaii last about 1,500 years ago. For Craig, this was a massive discovery, and with great excitement, he told me that he believed that the first human swimmers and divers had lived here long ago. He stressed that the only way to access the cave was by swimming along the high sea cliffs, so it was obvious to him that this person must have been very strong in the water. As for motive, Craig felt that these people would have had a very good reason to go into the kelp forest. An abundance of very nutritious food is available, and it's very easy to gather it if you can swim and dive. Mollusks such as abalone, elicrucal, which is a giant turban snail, also known as a periwinkle, and limpets are very common and accessible even in shallow water, and the reefs would have been teeming with crayfish and many species of fish. As inshore resources were depleted, it made sense to him that early divers would have pushed themselves deeper and deeper to gather fresh stocks. Unlike the land, which would have been full of predators, the kelp forests are almost totally devoid of animals that could threaten a human. Although the great white shark had been seen in the forest on rare occasions, it's known to hunt in deep water, where it can attack from below. Besides, humans are not considered its prey. 
This made a lot of sense to me because I, re I remember I had easily been able to gather seafood for my family even when I was a child. I asked Craig how early humans would have been able to see underwater without a mask. He told me that we do, in fact, have the ability to, de to develop very good underwater vision. As an experiment, he had tried diving without a mask and fins and found that he could see and feel enough to easily gather enough food to feed a family in a single dive. He also believed that the kelp forest is one of the few is one of the best places to learn how to swim in the ocean because kelp is so buoyant and makes it easy for you to pull yourself down to the ocean bed. It's also easy to move on the surface from from one kelp raft to another. Moreover, the dense kelp disperses the force of the waves, so the water is generally very calm, making for a great swimming nursery. Craig told me that he had spent the past few months developing this theory and had talked to Chris Hen she would about it at length. Chris and his team had found dag daggerad fish bones in the Blombos Caves, which was fascinating because these fish only occur in deep water, starting at 66 feet, and don't wash ashore in cold snaps. This suggested that early modern humans were fishing or spearfishing off deep reefs. The southern Cape Coast also had many rivers at the time, and Craig believed it was highly likely that these early nomadic humans were able to cross them. I was interested in Craig's theories, but I was even more interested in his enthusiasm for the kind of life these early humans would have lived. Fervently, he explained how he would have loved to live a wild life, which to me seemed like madness. I felt sorry for this human ancestor who had died alone in a small rocky cave cut off from the rest of the world. It felt like an awful way to go, and I didn't share Craig's romantic enthusiasm for the wild life at all. I couldn't understand why he would want to live in such cruel conditions, so alien to our lives of comfort. This skull was the ultimate symbol of death to me, and I couldn't help but think of the great death that our planet is now experiencing at our human hands. It seemed ironic that we were sitting there with the remains of one of the last wild humans during the time of the sixth great extinction, the only extinction caused by man. Thousands of years of domestication had brought me back home to this cold and lonely sea cave, and I felt like a sick, stupid fool. Like cannibals, our species had turned on itself, fathers devouring sons. I now had a sense of the great forgetting Kreka told me about. The sun was setting behind the cliffs and a strong headwind was building. We packed up, climbed into our kayaks, and were soon, he soon heading home across the ominous sea. I took a last look back at that forlorn cave, and in the gloom, a few lines from William Shakespeare's The Tempest came to mind. Full fathom five thy father lies, of his bones are coral made. Those are pearls that were his eyes, nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. I braced myself for the long paddle ahead, and with every homeward stroke, my heart felt heavier. All right, that is it for part four.